I'm going to invite you to take your Bibles or your Bible apps and turn to the book of Genesis. Chapters 1 and 2 is where we're going to be spending time this morning. So Genesis 1 and 2. If you don't have a Bible with you, that's okay. Grab one of those in the pew around you. They look just like this one. And turn to page 2. Seriously, page 2. That's where we're going to be. So uh, it's easy to find way in the front. Hey, while you're finding the text, uh, as we're continuing our, our series called The Core... Uh, let me tell you about Halloween, uh, what we're doing here. It's coming up in a couple of weeks. I know it's Sunday morning, and so this doesn't uh, apply to you guys as much. Uh, you guys know we have services on Saturday, right, 4.30 and 6 uh, on most Saturdays. If you like better uh, you know, seating and parking, then I'd invite you to come then. Uh, but, uh, but here's the deal. Halloween falls on a Saturday, two weeks from yesterday. And, uh, and we didn't want to really put a, a, a tension between do you go to church or do you do kids stuff with your, with your kids. So, so we're going to do church on that Saturday, on Halloween Saturday, on, at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. And immediately after the service, we're going to have a giant kids party here. Uh, Julie's calling it Halloween Jam. So uh, the kids can come to church dressed up in costume and everything. Uh, in fact, the parents can come in costume too. We don't care. I'm going to be in costume that day. And, uh, and, and so uh, and this is going to have this, this big party that's happening uh, for a couple of hours. The rest of us are going to be down on Main Street serving uh, that evening, uh, helping out with Fright Night and things like that like we normally do. But we didn't want uh, Halloween to get in the way of what we're doing as a church and as uh, blessing our families and putting them in that place. And by the way, if you grew up in church or, or you know, at all, then, then Halloween is kind of one of those weird things. When I was a kid, Halloween was just Halloween. You put on costumes, you went and got candy, right? That's all it was. It was just an opportunity, a reason, an excuse for kids to gorge on candy. Wonderful, wonderful day, right? You guys all with me? And then as we got older, suddenly Halloween became an issue. You know, it was an issue in the church because people started saying, well, it's evil and you shouldn't celebrate it, you shouldn't do anything. So we stopped celebrating Halloween in church, right? And what do we do? We did fall festivals and harvest festivals where kids put on costumes and got lots of candy. <laughs> Nothing like Halloween at all. <laughs> and, and we did that for a number of years here at Calvary and we did it well. And then we got invited to go down to Main Street and help them out with Fright Night, blessing kids with candy and games. And so we decided to do that and serve our community on Halloween. And, and here's the thing. If you still struggle with what Halloween means and all that kind of stuff, uh, understand that the Bible says, this is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. And so we're going to honor Jesus on Halloween of all days. We don't care because uh, we're going to honor Jesus every day. And we're going to use this, opera, this day of candy and costumes as a way to reach our friends and our neighbors with the gospel of Jesus Christ. So if you're a family and you got kids and they want to come to the Halloween jam, then great. Put, have them all put on their costumes. Bring them to church Saturday afternoon. We're going to have a party. It's going to start at 3. Uh, and it's just going to go on. And it's going to be a great time of celebrating life that we have in Jesus Christ. So I want you to know about Halloween. So if you want to come to the, the service, if you want to come to the party, if you want to come to all of it, none of it, it's, that's all good. Uh, I just want you to know where we stand on that. So uh, if your friends ask you, you can tell them. So we live in a world of 24-7 connectivity. Have you ever noticed that? I mean, uh, how many of you freak out if you can't, you know, get a phone signal? <laughs> you know, it just, you go up to the Wallapies for the day and you can't enjoy the kids because you're like, I can't post it on Facebook. <laughs> See, how many of us have been blessed with cell phones? Got a cell phone? Good. This is your reminder. Turn it down. <laughs> Set that button on the side of the phone does. Uh, it turns it down. See, if it goes off now, you're open season, you know. <laughs> Because we just talked about turning it down. And some of you are like, oh, I turned it down. Yeah, maybe you did, maybe you didn't. Uh, how many of you are on Facebook or Twitter or Instagram or social media some way? Oh, come on, there's more of you than that. You know it. <laughs> you see, we live in a world that is filled with Facebook posts and likes and Twitter followers. And yet, as a people, as a culture, we are disconnected and lonely. You know, they're, they're doing all these articles talking about how people are, are living lives of loneliness because thousands of people can know what we had for lunch and who you're with and where you are and what you like and never know the real you. And so our world is desperate for authentic, vibrant, loving community. I mean, people can casually hook up on Tinder without all the mess of relationships and yet every one of us desperately wants to be known and loved. 
That's why at Calvary, one of our core values is connection. Connection. Life change happens when people connect through relationships. You see, we're in our series called The Core, and and what we're talking about is our core values, our essential doctrines, what we believe, who we are. Uh, If you're a part of Calvary, it's because we want to remind you what really is important to us. And and if you're new to Calvary or checking us out, we want to share with you who we are because we don't play games here. We just kind of put it out on the table and tell you everything up front. And so we're doing that, spending some time doing that. And a couple weeks ago, we talked about calling, that we are called to lead people to a life-changing relationship with Jesus. It's not an option. And last week, we talked about character, that we cannot represent Jesus unless we reflect his character. And today, we're going to talk about connection. Life change happens when people connect through relationships. And and while we look at this core value of connection, I want to challenge you to do one thing. I want to challenge you to listen in and evaluate if you're connected at the three levels that God intends for all of us to be connected. Kind of look at your life and relationships that we talk about and go, am I I connected in the way that I should be? So here we go. Uh, First of all, we were created to connect with God. We were created to connect with God. Genesis chapter 1, verse 27. It's on page 2, if you have a Bible like mine. <laughs> it says, So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. You see, God created us to connect with him. He made us in his image, and God has a perfect relationship in himself. God didn't create us because he was lonely and needed friends. You see, he's the the Trinity. We talk about the Trinity. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. He was completely happy in relationship with himself, but he made us to have a relationship with him. We need to have a relationship with him. A, A loving, intimate, joyful relationship was the design of creation. And then, of course, we trash that. When we rebelled against God in the garden, we, we kind of threw that whole relationship out. We said, God, we want to live on our terms, not on your terms. We want to do life our way, not your way. And so by making that choice, we earned the right to go to hell. <laughs> Isn't that nice? That's, that, that was what we got out of this. And, and so uh, the wages of sin is death, Scripture says. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So God loves us, and he didn't want to leave us in a place without hope. And so he sent Jesus into this world to suffer and die for our sins so that we could be reconciled to God, so that we could be included again in that relationship that we were created to have. Now, when we follow Jesus, when we believe that Jesus is the Son of God, the Savior of the world, when we believe that he died on the cross to pay for our sins and was raised from the dead, and we make that commitment to follow Jesus with our lives we become sons and daughters of God. We get adopted into his family. Now, that, that's just awesome, but we were created to connect with God. So I have to ask you this. Have you experienced that life-changing relationship with Jesus Christ? You saw a picture of that with Steve as he declared his faith, his life change in Jesus to, to all of us. Have you had that moment where you understand that you once were were a different person and now because of your relationship with Jesus, you're a new creation? If you can't say yes to that, what are you waiting for? God is inviting you into a relationship with himself. And and, and this is, it, it all begins when we surrender control of our lives and we ask Jesus to be our Savior. And if you haven't done that, then stop listening to me and start talking to God because nothing else I say is going to matter to you today. Because there's nothing else as important as your relationship with God because it shapes all the other relationships in our life. This is the one that shapes our eternity. You see, we were created to connect with God. Now, if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, you know that Jesus is your Savior, you know that that heaven is your destiny, uh, you know your sins have been forgiven, then how is your connection with God? Because God wants to have a relationship with us. He doesn't just want to say, label us, okay, you're in, you're in, you're in, you're good, and, and then discard us. He cares about us, and he wants to have a relationship with each one of us, personal. I've got two daughters, they're adults, but I still love to sit and listen to them and talk with them and hear their dreams and their frustrations and, and, and all of life. 
I desire that relationship with them. And guess what? Your heavenly Father desires that intimate relationship with you. So when was the last time you had a conversation with God? The Bible calls that prayer. Prayer. I'm talking about beyond thank you for this day and for this food. When was the last time you really took some time and brought your hopes and your dreams and your fears and your failures and and all your stuff to God and just laid it out before him? When was the last time you read the love letter that God wrote to you? You see, that's what this book is. It's a letter from God saying, here's who I am, and, and by the way, I love you and I want to bless you. If you'll live according to this book, you'll get to know me and we'll have a relationship and I will guide your life into places of peace and joy that you never imagined. When was the last time you just said, God, I need to hear from you? And you spent time in the pages of this book. Uh, By the way, it's why we give them away. We want you to have it. We want you to read it because we know it'll change your life. So we were created to connect with God. How is your connection at that point? Secondly, we were designed to belong to family. Not only did God create us to be in a relationship with him, but he created us to be in relationship with others. Genesis chapter 2, verse 18. Don't even have to turn the page if you have a Bible like mine. It says, Then the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make a helper fit for him. Now realize, this is in paradise. This is before there was sin in the world. Nothing was messed up. And God looked at Adam and said, It's not good that he's lonely. Not good that he's lonely. Now, God is wise, and he designed each of us to be in a family and have community. Uh, And and by the way, I don't know about you, but I agree with God. It is not good to be alone. Anybody with me on that? Yeah. I I, I just confess, I'm pathetic alone. I mean, when Meralda goes out of town for a few days, I mean, I stay up too late. I eat junk. I overschedule my life. I'm just a mess. And and she makes me better. She makes me healthier. She makes me happier. I mean, just all of that. It's not good to be alone. And so God designed us for family. First of all, every one of us was born into a family. You're born into a family. You didn't choose them. They didn't choose you. Uh, It just happens. And by the way, I'm not going to ask you whether or not if you could choose your family of origin, whether you would, because that's beside the point. It doesn't matter by now. Uh, But see, our families influence us. They shape us. Let's be honest. They warp us for life, right? And, and, And every family blesses and every family curses because of sin. And, and so, uh, in fact, here's kind of my philosophy on family. It gives you something to talk about over lunch. See, I hope this doesn't offend you, but I believe that every family is crazy, right? I'm not talking about just has a crazy person in them because they all have that too, but I'm talking about every family is crazy, blesses and curses. They're, they're just there, and, and they affect us. And so over lunch, talk about what kind of crazy was your family of origin, You know, were they crazy mean? Were they crazy fun? Were they crazy strange? Were they crazy addicts? Were they crazy, you know, whatever. See, my family of origin, uh, they were too crazy in two ways, two big ways. First of all, my parents were like crazy workaholics, and that influenced everything that happened in our family. My, My parents literally did not take a vacation that didn't involve work in some way until they were in their 50s. It was, it was nuts. You know, they, hey, we're going over to the cousins, and we're going to build a shed and paint a room and fix plumbing while we're there. <laughs> Great. That's awesome. So they were, they were crazy workaholics. And my family was crazy movers. We, I lived in 15 houses by the time I was 18 years of age. <laughs> See, yeah, you guys are all going, that's nuts. Yes, I told you. It's crazy. I grew up thinking I was in the witness protection program. <laughs> we... You know, we're always moving. We're moving again. Okay. I mean, we, we had boxes that nobody knew what was in them. We just moved them from house to house to house. <laughs> so, you know, families are crazy. Have some fun talking about uh, crazy. Ask your kids how you guys are crazy. I mean, that could be fun. But see, <laughs> no. <laughs> they won't tell you. They, you can still ground them. So, uh, but see, God designed families to bless. He put us in families to bless us, to nurture and protect, to teach and to work and to play and discipline, to to grieve together and comfort together and celebrate together. In fact, the very first ministry responsibility that God gives any of us is our family. We're called to lead our families to follow God. 
to be in relationship with Jesus Christ. And, and so are you being the, the husband and the father that God's called you to be? Are you being the, the wife and the mom that God wants you to be? Are you being the grandparents that are leading your grandkids toward Jesus? Because that's our first area of ministry responsibility. In fact, it qualifies us or disqualifies us for all the rest. So we're born into a family, but you choose a church. You choose a church. You see, we are the family of God. And the moment you confess Jesus, you are adopted as sons and daughters of God by faith in Christ. And God put his Holy Spirit in us who unites all of us together into this one cosmic reality called the body of Christ and the family of God, which means that we are related. Spiritually, we're related. And guess what? That relationship's gonna last an eternity. And some of you just realized, these people are going to heaven with me. Uh, you know, and, and by the way, here, let me just share this little theory with you that is completely and totally non-biblical. It's just one of Chad's weirdnesses. You know, God wants us to forgive each other, right? He, he wants us to be kind and compassionate to each other. So if there is somebody in, in, who's a believer that you are really angry at, that you're not forgiving, that you got a grudge against, you need to go ahead and forgive them now and settle that now and, and be kind and compassionate to them now. Because I've got this crazy theory that if you don't settle it now and we're related eternally, that for the first 10,000 years in heaven, you're going to be their roommate. <laughs> I'm just saying, don't, don't give God that reason to do that in your life. Because if he did, you know, uh, you'd love it anyway because it's heaven and you didn't care. But you see, you choose a church. Now, some people say, I can follow Jesus and I don't need church. I can love Jesus, and I don't need to go to church, and church doesn't help me, and all that kind of stuff. And, and I just really want to say, really? Can you do that? Think about this biblically for a moment. Uh, Jesus said the church, or excuse me, the Bible says that, that the church is the bride of Jesus. The church is the bride. In fact, the relationship between Jesus and the church is the model for the relationship between husbands and their wives. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Wow. Jesus is nuts about the church. He loves the church. He died for the church. He wants to bless the church. So you're telling me that you can hang out with Jesus and be close to Jesus and have this great relationship with Jesus and hate his wife? Well, I don't hate her. I just want to say bad things about her, like she's a hypocrite and she does all this stuff wrong and things like that. Really? So how's that going to work in your relationship with your wife, if you got a friend that doesn't, doesn't like her. In fact, it just bad mouths her all the time, doesn't want to hang out with her. So if you come to me and you say, hey, I want to be your bud, I want to be, let's hang out together, let's take trips together, let's do stuff like that, but just you can't bring your wife, yeah, it's not happening, right? It's not going to happen. I'm going to be like, hey, she's more important than you are, sorry about that. I mean, I'll love you and I'll care for you because it's my job and I'll, and I'll minister to you, but uh, we're not going to be pals, See, that, that's just me, and I'm a sinner. Uh, how do you think Jesus feels? He, he loves the church. We ought to be affectionate toward the church. We ought to choose a church and be a part of it. And, and then theologically, 1 Corinthians 12 says that we are the body of Christ, and all of us are important members of this body. All of us are necessary to the body to be healthy and whole. And every one of us has gifts and abilities that contribute to the kingdom of God. And, and in fact, Paul says one part of the body can't say to the other, you're unimportant. You know, the hand can't say to the foot, I don't need you, or the ear can't say to the eye, you're not important. But see, here's what, what I've come to realize, that the members all need each other, but the members don't do well on their own, right? So if, uh, if a tragedy happened and your arm got cut off, you can go on living. Your body can continue to live. How's your arm going to do? Is it going to function really well? No, because we don't have like that, you know, the thing crawling around like the Adams family all over the place here. <laughs> yeah, your, your arm's going to shrivel up and die. You know, if your ear gets cut off, you know, you can still go on with life, but your ear's not going to do well not being connected to your head. You see, the body wants all the members to be a part of it, but the members need to be connected to the body. We need each other. If we're going to be healthy and strong spiritually, then we need to be connected to a body of believers, a local church where we see the body come together and serve and be what God intended us to be. So there's two ways that we want to encourage you to connect at Calvary. 
beyond this weekend worship service. Because this isn't really a connection. This is like a crowd. Right? Because you can slip in late. You can leave early and never really talk to anybody. Okay, maybe one of those annoying greeters gets you on your way in. But, you know, you can just pretty much ignore everybody. I mean, we try to force interaction with that whole greeting time, which half of you hate. You know, and you're like, I don't want to shake their hands. They have germs. They look gross. Uh, yeah, you know, but that's not connection. So here's where, what we want each person to connect with. First of all, a life group. Life groups. Life groups are small groups that meet in homes that talk about the sermon, encourage each other uh, to grow in their relationship with Christ, support one another. It, it's, it's a great thing. Right now, uh, between life groups and, and homes and Bible studies on campus, we've got about 50 groups with about 750 adults in them. That's really cool except we've got about twice that many uh, adults that are connected to Calvary in some way, shape, or form that don't have a group. We want you to be in a group. And, and, and I'm not just saying this because I'm the pastor. I'm telling you this because I'm in a life group, and it's a blessing for myself and my wife. I, I mean, you know, it's a place where we have friends, and we, and we have fun, and we support each other and encourage each other, and there's accountability. It is a place where we experience life the way that God intended the church to be a family. And so if you're not in a life group, I'm going to encourage you to check out life groups when they come available uh, in a couple of months. Now, the problem is, I already told you, we got more people than we have life groups, and we need more life groups, which means we need life group leaders. And some of you are qualified and called by God to be life group leaders. And if God is nudging you right now, then this week you need to get with Pastor Chet or Mike Wilkinson and talk about that. So life groups is a connection point. The second connection point is ministry teams. We want you to get involved serving God, building the kingdom on one of our teams that, that does ministry. I mean, this place runs on volunteers. Uh, and people are serving all over the place. And we need that. We don't, we don't happen as a church without that. And we don't impact our community without people serving our community. So let me just remind you. Halloween evening, we're going to be down on Main Street. We're going to be manning game booths. We're going to be handing out candy to kids, and we need volunteers to help us make that happen. Now, we invite our life groups to sign up and take a booth and, and man it for the evening, but guess what? It's Saturday night. It's going to be, you know, four hours long. We're going to need extra help. If you want to connect and you want to serve God in, on Main Street, there's going to be a table set up outside on your way out. Stop by there. Get the information. Say, hey, let me help. Let me help. Let me use my gifts and abilities because all you have to do is like be friendly and hand out candy. Almost anybody can do that. I know some of you struggle with the friendly part, but uh, <laughs> that's okay because we need people to help set up and take down too, and there's no people around for that, so uh, perfect for you. Okay, so we're created to connect with God. How's your connection? We're designed for family, and we are sent to connect with our community. Matthew chapter 5, verse 13, Jesus said, you are the salt of the earth. The salt of the earth. Right after this, he said, uh, you're the light of the world. And I always liked that better because uh, that was what was preached more. Because I grew up in churches that really kind of encouraged us to avoid the world and the people in it. You know, just shine your light, stay away for, for, lest you get, catch something. And it didn't work so well. And so as I, as I listened as I, to Jesus, I said, hey, you know what? Jesus said we're the salt of the earth. And it finally made sense to me when, when you think about salt in a real life kind of setting. How many of you like salt? You like salt your food? Okay. Don't worry. Your doctors aren't watching. We won't, we won't tell on you. Okay. You like salt on your food. You're going to salt your food. Um, it, it, having the salt shaker on the table doesn't do anything for you, does it? And if you move it closer to your plate, it doesn't change the flavor of the food, does it? I mean, you can take the salt shaker and put it on your plate, and it still doesn't influence the food. What do you have to do? It yeah, you got to put the salt on the food. You got to put the salt on. It's got to touch the food for the food to change its flavor. That's what we have to do. If we're the salt of the earth, then we have to touch the lives of people who don't know Jesus if we're going to flavor them for Jesus. That means that we need to have real relationships with people who don't know Jesus Christ if we're going to accomplish our mission of leading people to a life-changing relationship with Jesus through the love of his people and the power of his truth. So we're sent to connect with our community. How are we going to do that? Two thoughts. 
First of all, we do that by living with the character of Christ. Living with the character of Christ. We spent the whole sermon on character last week, so I'm not going to develop this. This means that we treat people with respect, kindness, and compassion always. Always. Not just occasionally, but always we are intentional to, to be kind and compassionate to everyone we meet. This means being honest, paying our bills, not gossiping, not tearing people down verbally. This means tipping well and saying thank you and repenting of road rage before it gets crazy. (laughs) You see, we cannot represent Jesus unless we reflect his character all the time. And not only do we live with the character of Christ, but we're serving in the love of God. We're serving in the love of God. You see, we serve because we're servants. We serve to glorify Jesus. We serve because people need help. We serve because this is our community and we want to make it better. I mean, after all, we live here, right? And we serve so that we can earn the right to be heard. So that, so that we have the right to speak into people's lives the truth that will set them free. Now, Here's what that looks like on Main Street. I, and I know this because I've been there for years. We've been down on Main Street, and I've watched this happen. You know, Calvary people show up. They, you know, most of us wear Calvary shirts. We're, we're there. We're smiling. We're laughing. We're playing with the kids. We're telling them how cute they are in their costumes. We're giving them gobs of candy. I mean, we're the most generous candy people on Main Street because you are the most generous church in the world with candy. So we're out there doing that, and invariably this conversation happens hundreds of times in the night. Why are you guys doing this? Well, because... God loves you, and, and we want to bless you in his name. And then they kind of go like, well, what, tell us about your church. What time are your services? What do you have for kids? And we have these conversations where we get to invite people to come to Calvary. And people have come here and had their lives changed because they hear about the hope that we have in Jesus Christ. They hear about forgiveness of sins for everything you've ever done and everything you'll ever do. They hear uh, about how you can live a life of courage and faith where you don't have to be freaked out by what's going on in the world because Jesus wins and we win. And Christ changes lives because we're serving in the love of God. That happens. And it'll happen this year and it'll happen next year because we are the salt of the earth. And we are sent by Jesus to connect with our community. So how are you connecting with the unchurched people of Lake Havasu City? How are you connecting? Because life change happens when people connect through relationships. Three levels of relationship. How are you doing? You were created to connect with God. You were designed to be in family. And you were sent by God to touch our community. What does God need to change in your life to help your connections? Let's pray. Father, thank you for loving us and for drawing us to yourself through Jesus Christ. We have no hope apart from him, and yet you have saved us through his sacrifice. You have included us in your family, and we are different because of that. And God, we want to be those people who know you and love you. We want to be those people who serve our families well. We want to be those people who influence our community as the salt of the earth. So God, change us as individuals, change us as a church so that we can be your people. This is our prayer. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand and worship our God.